Research and Health, Translating Science to Practice. I would like to brief, briefly review the agenda for this webinar. First, I will explain how to submit a question to our presenters. Then, Gabriella Neosadi, Director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Practice-Based Research Network Resource Center, will introduce today's presenters. We will have a Q&A session with each presenter and a final Q&A with both presenters. At the end of the webinar, I will explain how to obtain your CME Certificate of Participation for this webinar. Please note that after today's webinar, a copy of the presentation slides will be emailed to all webinar participants. The recording of today's webinar will be posted to YouTube, and participants will be notified once the video is available. If at any point during this webinar you have trouble hearing our presenters, please try hanging up the phone or headset and dialing back into the webinar. Today's presenters have no financial relationships to disclose, and they will not discuss off-label use and or investigational use of medications in the presentation. To submit a question, you may use the GoToWebinar control panel. Type a question under the Questions section and hit Send, as shown in the screenshot on this slide. You may submit a question at any time during the presentation. During the Q&A session, as time allows, your questions will be read out loud and our presenter will respond. Presenters will respond. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Neo Sadi. Thank you. Welcome everyone. On behalf of Rebecca Roper, Director of the PBRN Initiative at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and on behalf of the PBRN Resource Center, we welcome you to this webinar. We will have two presenters today. Dr. Ross Brownson is the Bernard Becker Professor of Public Health at Washington University in St. Louis. He is involved in numerous community-level studies designed to understand and reduce modifiable risk factors such as physical inactivity, obesity, and tobacco use. In particular, he's interested in the impacts of environmental and policy interventions on health behaviors and he conducts research on dissemination of evidence-based interventions. Dr. Brownson is the author of seven books and over 400 peer-reviewed articles. He is the immediate past president of the American College of Epidemiology. Our second speaker will be Dr. Graham Kolditz. Dr. Kolditz is the Nice Gain Professor of Surgery, Associate Director of Prevention and Control at the Washington University School of Medicine, Seitman Cancer Center, and Deputy Director to the Institute for Public Health. Dr. Cold is trained in medicine at University of Queensland, Australia, and in public health at Harvard University. His dissertation and implementation sciences research includes colorectal cancer screening, access to prevention services, and methods as summarized in books and journal articles. I will now turn our presentation over to Dr. Brownson to begin the webinar. Great, thank you. Let me pull up my screen. Hello everyone, uh, it's great to be with you today. I guess it's morning for some and afternoon for others. Um, I'm Ross Brownson, as Gabriella noted, work at Washington University with, with Graham here and we're delighted to be uh, talking with you today about um, dissemination and implementation research. Um, the first part I will set up is sort of what it is and why it matters. Um, and you can see in the title we've got this metaphor for our, our daily activities is the leaky pipeline and we'll show you in a minute what we mean by that. Um, and then Graham will talk about some specific research opportunities um, within the broad umbrella of, of DNI research. And I like this quote from uh, Pasteur. Um, that we all are excited when we have new discoveries, but we're even more excited and our, our cup runneth over when, uh, when we have practical applications. And I think that's sort of the, the backdrop for DNI science, that um, most of us, if not nearly all of us, get into the field of medical research or public health research or, or practice not to simply discover new knowledge, but to apply new knowledge and improve the health and well-being of populations. And so that's really what we're here about today and why we're, why we're going to be talking. Um, and so I'll do the first couple of these to talk about some of the challenges we face and, and some of the, the backdrop of DNI science in this uh, 
what we'll talk about is the discovery to delivery gap and the, uh, the leaky pipeline metaphor. And then we'll talk just briefly about some of the solutions, some of the things our science can bring, in, including the need for theory and framework. And then Graham will talk about the opportunities as I noted. So now we're going to do a quick um, interactive exercise where we're going to do a, a brief poll. So uh, we're handing it back to the organizers to open up the poll. So if you go on, the poll should be opening. Is it working? Yes, and everyone is voting. We'll just keep it open a couple more seconds. And we will now share the results. Great. Thank you. Sure. Great. So I'm going to go on to my other slide. So um, this is good, Graham. I think we pitched this at the right level. Um, so it looks like about two-thirds are beginners, 30% are intermediate, and about 3% are advanced. And of course, I didn't really define DNI research for you yet, so you're obviously answering a poll question with maybe if you're a beginner, learning more of what, what the actual definition is. But um, I think this is probably fairly indicative of the field. Um, as a formal field, this is a fairly new science really within just about the last 10 to 15 years has NIH in particular, our big, our big funder of research in the U.S., put a lot of emphasis into it. Of course, agencies like AHRQ, the CDC in Atlanta, a lot of these other agencies have been doing DNI science since their founding, but, but the actual treating it as a science and a fundable kind of research is pretty, pretty recent. So that's interesting to know, and we'll keep that in mind going through. All right, so I'll move on. Um, so you'll, some of you will remember the Apollo space missions and when we were sending men to the moon, and, and this was the old saying, is Houston, we have a problem. That's, that's the, the words you didn't want to hear if you're on that space capsule on the Apollo moon flights. And so we do have a problem, and how do we know we have a problem? Well, we, we have a few issues that come up and when our issue has really arrived. And one is that we see our issue in the popular press. This is a, an article in Newsweek from now, I guess, about six, seven years ago. Um, Sharon Bagley, a, a lead health and medical reporter for Newsweek. And this is an interesting article about, about the, the valley of death, as she called it, between new discoveries and treatments. And really, um, almost sort of outrage that we spend so much on discovering new knowledge and discovering cru uh, the cures for diseases, but we're not applying them the way we should. And then, of course, the other way I think it's important to know our issue has arrived is when we have a cartoon, and I think this cartoon might summarize um, our whole talk for today. The latest research shows that we really ought to do something with all this research. Um, and that gets to the notion of, of not just doing research for the sake of research. Many of you on the line are in academic institutions, and of course, uh, publishing books or publishing journal articles, and we used to have the the notion of bench to bedside and bedside to practice, but too often what we get is bench to bookshelf. That, or now more recently, it's it's bench to cloud, I guess. But you know, the bookshelf is where where our discoveries often sit. If you think of translation of how practice audiences might use our discoveries, um, I know for our work in public health, roughly 30% of leaders of public health agencies regularly read journal articles, and so. We're not going to reach the majority of many practitioners if we simply go into uh, and put our discoveries in journal articles or in books or in the cloud. So that's important to know. Um, if you remember way back into your history classes, many of you will remember the, the famous explorer Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer. Uh, I think he was the one credited with linking up Asia with Europe through his travels. And he's got an important DNI evidence to practice or discovery to practice um, illustration here. So he was one of the first to um, identify the problem of scurvy. Scurvy was a big problem for people who were going to be off on ships for a long period of time. And you could see in his voyage in 1497, the majority of his crew died from scurvy. And they suspected citrus. Um, that we later learned that it was vitamin C in citrus that was the underlying um, cause, that is the lack of vitamin C. We had later uh, studies where Lancaster applied lemon juice, which included vitamin C, 
and we saw uh, mortality rates change dramatically. We then saw Lind um, did a randomized trial in 1747, and we can go on in time, and we didn't really get a formal policy about, about uh, the proper diets until 1865. So you could argue that from the time of Lancaster to the time of the actual policy was a mere 264 years. I'll show you in a, in a minute that maybe our years aren't quite this long, but, but in, in some cases it might be um, at least decades or even sometimes maybe longer than that. So that's important to keep in mind, and this is maybe an extreme example, but one that I think does a nice job of, of blending uh, history with scientific discovery with um, health. Um, this is a way, that, so there's a, a famous article by, by Ballas and Boren um, that, that is often quoted in DNI research, and that the famous discovery is that, or the famous line is that it takes 17 years of original clinical practice discovery research to make it into practice. Um, and so it's a very long pipeline, 17 years. They've, they've got little break-off points along the way from the time it, what it takes for your research to get funded. You do the research, you have results, you submit it, you finally get it accepted, it gets published. And then the longest lag line is actually the time from when it gets into a, a research guideline of some kind, like a community guide, a clinical practice guideline, to when that guideline is, is used. And so that's where we get this idea that only 14% of, of original research is applied, and when it is applied, it takes a long time, a couple of decades. So the promise for us is this idea of DNI research, that we move along the discovery to delivery continuum. You can see over on the left some, some uh, text from the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research at, at the NIH, that they recognize this gap. They're trying to do something about it at NIH, at HRQ, at many other agencies. In fact, this is really the heart of practice-based research and what your research networks are all about, of trying to move along this continuum and get further up to the, the, the right-hand side of this continuum. Um, these are just definitions, so I won't spend much time talking about the definitions. You'll have these. Um, at the end, I think we've got some resources, and, and we, can, we can provide you with resources where there's a whole glossary of of different definitions related to DNI research, but the only real difference I want to point out here is dissemination. You see the word active in the definition. In both, def in both definitions of dissemination and implementation, you see the terminology of evidence-based intervention. So that's kind of the focus of what is going to be disseminated or implemented. And then the difference with implementation is you see a specific setting. So if you're doing something that's broad, it might be dissemination. If it's more narrow in, say, in a school or in one clinic, it's probably an implementation study, and then the focus being an evidence-based intervention. This is just another way of characterizing and my somewhat arbitrary distinctions between dissemination and implementation research. Um, both are messy, but perhaps dissemination is even more messy because it's a broader spread. If you think more at the policy and media levels, it's probably more of a dissemination study. If you think in a specific setting, it's more of an implementation study. Um, and then all affect all levels from primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So all the way from primary prevention of a disease or a condition to treatment and re rehabilitation. Um, here's the, the, the illustration of this, of this leaky pipeline. Um, and over on the left-hand side, we've got our funding of new studies. And over on the right-hand side, we've got the practice and policy. And the usual kind of academic pathway goes across the bottom here. We do peer review, we publish things, we synthesize our research, we produce guidelines, and magically we see that a practice changes. And we know that doesn't always happen. What we need better attention to, and this is from an article that Graham did with Rebecca Lobb here at Washington University, is to put more emphasis on the top of this, more about stakeholder input more um, balance between not only internal validity but also external validity, um, better synthesis of observational studies and what we might call natural experiments, and then guidelines, evidence-based interventions, and probably more research on how we get guidelines used more, uh, better and more often. This is another area that's important. So attention to both the top and the bottom. There are many, many different research topics. This is from NIH. These are just four quick examples of the types of studies 
that could be done under the heading of dissemination implementation research. And then you could think of um, your own kind of an implementation study. So I know some of you on the line work in primary care. So if you think of, for example, the A recommendations in the clinical guidelines, um, why aren't those being implemented? That's an implementation problem. Things we know are effective, in many cases even cost effective, that aren't being done in primary care practice. And so that would be an implementation problem. It could start out from studying barriers all the way up to taking a more systematic approach to addressing those barriers and increasing implementation. So the answer as the backdrop to some of those problems is the idea of implementation science, DNI as we call it, as I'm referring to today. Um, I'll give you first a little bit of a historical context. Um, the main driving theory um, for DNI science, the most cited theory by far, is what I'll mention in just a minute. I'll, I'll give his name is Ev Rogers, who um, developed the um, concept of diffusion of innovation. The studies were, in the U.S. at least, were mainly agricultural studies. Um, the original studies go back over 100 years to a French ju judge named Tarde, who, who studied people coming in his court and started drawing, drawing diffusion curves. And I'll, I'll show you the curves in a minute. But these, these, this illustration shows um, the diffusion of agricultural practices. So if you look over here on the right-hand side, you'll see the, the linkage to the, the science. So this is kind of the nerdy guy who is the, the agricultural scientist. And what you see there is this is um, maybe the innovator. This is the person that knows about the new discovery or is even discovering it him or herself. But you see that person isn't connected to very many people. You see there aren't many arrows, only one arrow is connecting that. But then you see the person over kind of in the middle left-hand side who we'd call the opinion leader. This is kind of the, the popular kid in high school who always had a lot of things to do on Friday night. And you see that person has a lot of connections. And so when, when they started to begin to study this diffusion, they began to look at these different change agents and how, how new innovations, a new seed corn, a new farming practice, a new way of, of rotating crops, for example, diffused. And now that's been largely applied in health. Um, we see curves. We see a lot of things that happen are in the early phase that there's a fairly small percent of, of only a few percentage of people that we would call innovators. And the vast majority where we really can affect health and change is trying to address this, this group in the middle, the early majority and the late majority. And so this is the science um, that Ev Rogers really pioneered. And if you haven't read his book on the diffusion of innovation, it's fascinating. And it applies, you know, much of his book is not written about health. It's written about, you know, political innovations or, or media innovations, things in the popular press, a lot of different pieces of this coming together. And then probably among more recent models, uh, some of you will have heard of REAIM that was Originally, the, the term was coined and, and fleshed out by Russ Glasgow, who's at the University of Colorado. Um, and the idea of REAIM is sort of a phased framework for thinking about how evidence-based practices make their way into a larger scale use and dissemination. And so the, the REAIM is, well, E is effective. So you have an effective intervention or not. So that's where you start with the E. The, the R is the reach, the A is, is how well it's adopted in different settings, the I is implementation, and then the M stands for maintenance or how, how long lasting the effects will be. And so I'm going to give you a quick sort of hypothetical illustration of, of re-aim in what we call the law of halves. And, and to think about where the, what David Chambers at NIH calls the voltage drop happens. Let's say we have a new discovery, let's say we have um, a new magic pill that along with the pill with counseling is effective at reducing, at treating obesity, at, at reducing the rate of obesity or, or, or if someone's lost weight, at, at increasing the ability to keep weight off. And so let's say that the, um, the pill itself is 40% effective. And so the first thing we want to think about is how many settings will adopt that. Let's say that 40% of the settings will adopt it. Maybe there's some barriers to being able to do the counseling. At that point, we have a 40% population-wide impact. Well, then maybe there's some side effects, so maybe not all the patients will accept that the new obesity treatment. And so then we have 
uh, 40 percent, multiply by 40 percent, and our population impacts down to 16 percent. Maybe there's some barriers to implementation that it's that it can't always be implemented the way we thought. Maybe there's some some challenges in having the right people trained to do the counseling part of the intervention. We do the math again, and we're now down to 6.4. Then we remember the overall effectiveness from the original efficacy studies is another 40 percent. And so we've got now down to a 2.6% reach, if you will, overall impact. And then we've got long-term maintenance. Maybe there's some challenges over the long haul. Maybe there's an expense of the pill or side effects or people don't go back to the counseling. We multiply again, and now we're down to a 1% effect. Of course, this is a made-up example, but you get the idea that we need to think across a continuum of effects, not just whether an intervention, a medical practice, a public health practice works or not. And so we want to focus not only on the numerator, but on the denominator, and think of this sort of stepwise process that, that REAIM tries to do. The other important part about dissemination and implementation is that we're trying to kind of look at what happens in the middle. We talk about the black box. So we've got the discovery over here on the left. We've got some miracle over here on the right where we've got the positive change in practice. What's happening in the middle, and how do we unravel that? And that's a lot of what, what DNI science is trying to do, is really trying to think about what's happening in the middle. If you've got two practices that otherwise look similar, why is one doing better in implementing these, these A recommendations, and one why is, is not doing as well in implementing these. And then there's a lot of other frameworks, and I'm not going to spend much time on these. Some of the original frameworks for, for DNI research and thinking about how to apply these issues were really a pipeline, that it was kind of a, almost a linear process going from basic, um, basic science, behavioral science, doing some treatments, and then looking over here and we've got magically effectiveness and settings. Um, what really is, is more apparent now increasingly is kind of multi-level, uh, multi-method, multi-influence kind of kind of thinking. And so over here on the left, we, we might have something all the way, if you're doing a clinical intervention, all the way from the individual patient, all the way up to the larger system, maybe the, the reimbursement practices, so things like the Affordable Care Act would fit at the top of this framework for a clinical practice. You've got changes at the organizational level itself, and then nested within organizations, you've got groups of teams of providers. And over here on the right, you've got different assumptions or knowledge you need to have about how, how these levels are going to interact or not interact to end up making overall change. And so this is the concept many of you are familiar with of, of, of ecologic frameworks, things operating at multiple levels, where the levels um, where health changes occur when we address all these levels and we look at how the levels interact, cooperate, or don't cooperate. And then the terminology for translational research or for DNI research goes from T1 to the most basic research studies up to T4 to the, the real world applications. And that's really what we're trying to address here. I would say most of the emphasis now is, is trying to get a lot more into T3 and T4 kinds of studies. And in many ways the terminology is not as important as it is to think about where your research fits and perhaps what team members you need to be able to address the, the T level that makes the most sense for the type of work you're trying to do. This is the value. Um, Steve Wolf has written some nice pieces about why we need uh, later research, T2, T3, T4 research, and he argues that things like um, T2 research and later really can do more to improve health than a simply a new imaging device or a new class of drugs. And part of it, I think, is also our reimbursement systems that sometimes favor discovery, early stage discovery of drugs or devices and not the application of those. This is from an article that I think we have cited at the end uh, from Graham and Rebecca on the, a different way of sort of characterizing the T1 through T4 and how especially under the heading of team science that, that these T studies really need to interact between different groups. That, we don't want to only have basic scientists working only with other basic scientists, but we really would like to see uh, scientists, practitioners, stakeholders across all these levels working together. And this is put in the context of, of something a lot of you are familiar with, the NIH Roadmap Initiative. And so this is nice to think about 
in terms of both proximal stakeholders and then more distal stakeholders. Just to illustrate, uh, some of these come from Steve Wolf's work and others. Um, we could improve quality of care by more than 200% if we implemented feedback systems, more than 400% if we did institutional reminder systems. We can boost effectiveness of treatments by using what are often multi-method implementation strategies. So that might improve um, uh, financial incentives coupled with uh, training of practitioners or reminders. Or you, often they're multi-method kind of approaches. And then um, studies in organizational behavior looks at when we can reduce staff turnover, especially with a staff intensive delivery of an evidence-based intervention, it's very important and it can, it can also show benefits um, and improve our, our outcomes by up to 50%. And so then the last one, uh, this is from an article by Glasgow and Chambers that I think really does a nice job of highlighting some of the key characteristics of, of DNI science and DNI research. And I won't go through each one of these, but I'll just pull out a couple of the, the aspects that I think are really important. One is context. That um, just because an intervention worked in, um, in uh, the middle of New York City uh, doesn't mean that it's going to work out in rural Tennessee. And so context, the overall characteristics, the policy context, the characteristics of of patients, of providers, makes a big difference. The multi-level complexity refers to the ecologic frameworks. Um, the goals, are they pragmatic? You, you've heard the terminology now, I'm sure, of pragmatic clinical trials. And then the concept of scalability. That's a big topic in DNI research about if we know something's effective, what's it going to take to, to scale it up? Um, and so this article that was in Clinical and Translational Science is a is a nice read as, as sort of a background for DNI science and the characteristics and why it can be important and applicable. So that's the end of my part. And so what we're going to do now is see if there's, we're going to do questions in two sections. We'll do a short section now of any questions that you have for me. And then we'll come back after Graham's talk. He'll do the same. And then we'll come back and do overall questions at the end. So. If you have a question, if you haven't submitted, um, now's the time. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Brownson. Um, we are just putting up the instructions for how to submit a question. And we encourage everyone to submit your questions now so that we can uh, address them. And as Dr. Brownson said, we also will have a time at the, uh, at the end of the webinar and as well as after Dr. Coldis' presentation. So we're just going to wait a couple minutes. We haven't had any questions come through yet. Um, I think that's a testament as to how clear your presentation was. So thank you very much. We'll just give it another few seconds. Please submit your questions if you have any. Here is one. Um, can studies address both effectiveness and implementation simultaneously? That's great. And that's from, is it Whit, Whit Whiteman? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, um, yes, they can. Um, and I'll fact, we'll, if you want to, I think we have our emails in here. You can contact me and I'll send you the article. There's a nice article that Jeff Curran led on, on hybrid DNI designs. And, and, and they basically categorize three types of, of DNI research approaches. One is primarily effectiveness studies with a little bit of implementation. The middle one, hybrid two, is kind of a, about equal of, of effectiveness and implementation. And then the third is maybe we know most of what an effective evidence-based practice is, so we're doing less of that and mostly an implementation study. And they kind of characterize what it is in that continuum. And I think that's an important, important advance. And it's a really good question because originally we thought of it as you're either doing a, an implementation study or you're doing an effectiveness study, and there really is a way to do, to do both. So it's a great question. Thank you. Great. Now, we do have a number of questions coming in. So um, the next one asks, what do you consider the primary distinction between DNI and quality improvement? Well, that's a great question as well. I think they're very similar. In fact, I've seen 
Some people have tried to map some of the similarities between the two. Um, DNI, at least the way we think of it, is often a research approach, and quality improvement is often a, an organizational change approach. But if you, but you could argue that if you do quality improvement and you're evaluating it, you're gaining new knowledge and you're, and you're essentially doing research. So there's a lot of similarities. I would say that um, at least what I know about the quality improvement movement came a lot out of the private and the business sector. And I think that also illustrates how in our health-related fields in DNI science, we can really learn from allied fields like business sector. They don't like the Malcolm Baldrige quality improvement awards they, they give or, or the, the car companies that, that have quality awards. So I think there's, there's many similarities, but some differences that we can learn from as well. Great. Um, Another question also asking about differentiating, and this is, um, should we differentiate health services research with DNI research? Are they one under the umbrella of the other? You know, I think they're very similar, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to differentiate it so much. And to be honest, some of it is just um, is what, what helps you with funding opportunities. You know, for most of us, we need to get funding from one agency or a organization or another to be able to do our research. So I think sometimes if you have someone interested in health services research and you want to call it that, then it's fine to do that. If you've got an agency like the NIH that's got a specific program announcement on DNI research, then you probably want to frame it a little bit more. But I think when you're kind of looking at the spread of, of medical practice, policy, that often is under the umbrella of health services research. And I think maybe the only main difference is DNI research is often focused on a very specific evidence-based practice or a core set of evidence-based practices, but very similar, I think. Great, thank you. We'll do a couple more questions. Um, how much does the, do the funding mechanisms of research need to change in order to facilitate more T3 and T4 research? Mm -hmm. Oh, great question. So these are these are all. I'm hoping Graham. I was hoping Graham would get all the hard questions. <laughs> so far, it's we not can working. return to this at the end as well. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think they are slowly changing. Things change slowly, and I think actually there's some pretty good um, momentum for this field now in a number of different agencies. Um, I think the biggest challenge is really just the the sort of tough pay lines that we face in pretty much every setting, whether it's AHRQ or it's CDC or it's NIH or even the foundations. But it is changing slowly, definitely not at the pace I would like it to change, but I think it's more and more recognized. It also, if, if you're thinking of NIH for your funding, it's very institute specific. So a lot of it tends to depend on the personality and the, the, um, the professional of, um, priorities of the leadership of a certain agency. If, a, if an agency has leadership at the division, branch, and higher levels, let's say the National Cancer Institute or, or, or National Institute of Mental Health, where they really value this, then it's got a lot better traction in that agency. And many of you probably can frame your, your research under multiple disease and conditions. So if you're trying to pursue a DNI kind of a study, I'd make sure you reach out to the funder to see if that resonates with them or if you need to couch it in a different way. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk about the problem of providing access to the actual guidelines, which are often behind firewalls and unavailable to all, and how this might play a part in the lack of their uptake in primary care environments? Yes, that's, a, that's definitely a challenge. I work a lot with public health agencies and that's usually either the top or second barrier about them being able to use a, a, a clinical or a community-based guideline. Um, there's a couple things going on that are helping. The National Library of Medicine has been doing a fairly large project where, where they're experimenting. I think it's with five or six states where they're, where they're opening up access on, with, on a much wider level. Um, of course, the NIH and other, other federally funded research now is now a lot more required to provide free access um, and open access to, to federally funded research, but that doesn't always work with guidelines. Um, I think most of the major guideline developers have recognized this and are making the guidelines, you know, the HRQ work, Cochrane is getting better at this, although there's still some 
challenges, and definitely the CDC community guide are, are pretty much open access. So it's getting better, um, and I think that we need to keep pushing uh, to get these things open. I think the tension is always if there's a publisher who's publishing the guidelines and they're, and they're a publisher for profit, there's always going to be a tension between making something totally open access. Um, the increasing number of open access journals is helping. Um, in our field of DNI research, the journal Implementation Science is a, a really nice journal, and that is totally open access. Um, of course, it puts the burden of publishing on the, on the people submitting the articles, but for those reading the articles, it's, they're free articles. Great. Thank you. Um, probably have time for one question, uh, possibly two. Uh, you talked about you know, the importance of evidence-based research as a start. One question that came in is, can DNI proceed without clear evidence work to apply yet? If it is, so that would probably be, you could argue that's the hybrid one type study where you need more effectiveness work and you might just sort of dip your toe in the water for DNI research. Um, if you look at how the U.S. federal funders look at, at DNI research, they would probably say you need to have at least reasonable evidence at some level. Um, the trouble is, as, as you well know and maybe implicit in the question, is often the research is a lot slower process than the practice. And there's often things happening in practice that have a lot of face validity and maybe initial effectiveness, and yet the research studies haven't quite caught up with it. So I would say the, the best way to catch that if you're going into sort of the usual DNI funding pools is probably as a, as a hybrid one type of study. <clears throat> Great, thank you very much. Um, one more question, which asks about um, implementation and dissemination research are they're clearly different, but and uh, address different levels of translational research. However, they're frequently clustered together um, in our phase and other materials, and that might create some confusion. So the question is, when do you think we will be ready to separate the two, you know, and what needs to happen for that clarity, um, and is, it, as, is in fact distinguishing the two further um, important? Yeah, you know, that's, that, that probably depends on who you ask. I think if I was starting over, I would probably frame things more the way the um, Canadians and Australians have as knowledge translation. And they kind of put what we would call DNI research, which often are kind of separated out under the one heading of, of knowledge translation or knowledge exchange research, because they're, they're fairly arbitrary distinctions between dissemination research and implementation research. And so part of it is if you're writing an article or a, or an, or a publication, a journal publication or a, or a grant, it's knowing your audience and, um, and working toward the language that's going to resonate with that audience. Um, the glossary that Borsha Ravine worked on that's, that's one of the chapters in our book was really it's a first generation kind of a glossary and as you well know language evolves over time and so we're expecting that we wanted to develop a glossary to try to get some of the terminology cleared up but then we think it will it will take time to clarify even further um, and, it, and it may be if you're if you're talking with more of a general like a policymaker audience or the general public or patients, you want to think of terms that are even even don't use either dissemination or implementation. You might want to talk about how do we um, make your life better? How do we make your life better more quickly? Or you know, do something that you would that would resonate because the terminology is fairly cumbersome and and not all that accessible except for people who are very familiar with the terms. Great, thank you. All right, and I think we'll make this, this upcoming one the last question, um, so we can move on to Dr. Kolditz. Um, can pilot studies be part of DNI of a DNI study, especially when there's a need to contextualize prior research findings? Yes, definitely. In fact, that's probably when I, I, I was um, I had been on the, the DNI study section and, and for a number of years until until my parole last summer and. Um, the when we see a smaller grant, it often was a contextual sort of a grant where maybe you're developing a tool, you're measuring different types of context in a certain population or setting. And so a smaller grant might 
develop the tools to measure the context or decide what the context is for an evidence-based practice. And then a larger study might be that you need to show that you've already done the pilot work to know the context well enough to move forward with the with the DNI study. So it's definitely very important. Great. Well, thank you very much again for a terrific presentation. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, and we will now move it over to Dr. Kolditz. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here and I hope I build on some of the questions that we've seen and that Russ has been answering here already. So I'm going to talk a little bit more on uh, the opportunities and actually shift to the top of the <coughs> leaky pipeline. Russ already alluded to the emphasis we've tried to place on uh, stakeholder input uh, and really make that case so that we are not at the end of developing a guideline realizing that it's totally impractical out in the real world of clinical practice, but really folding the stakeholder input from the very beginning, framing the research question and uh, the design and conduct uh, to help shorten the process from research to practice, to help make the uh, actual uh, research relevant for uh, real world application. And so that to me is one of the places where as researchers we haven't always um, moved to engage stakeholders. We're maybe slower to do this in the real world than um, those of us writing about this. So how do we move to make better use of models and frameworks? A little building on some of the questions Russ was just answering. Um, one of our colleagues has done uh, extensive work looking at the sorts of models in the literature. Russ in his presentation talked about Ev Rogers and the diffusion of innovation model and one of the early models here used not just in our healthcare setting, but used extensively in education, actually in a way growing out of agricultural education, ag extension offices. So these principles span beyond uh, healthcare. Russ also talked about the REAIM uh, model, another one of the many models or frameworks we can use to uh, think through our uh, design and uh, actual conduct of our research. So from this, you know, you might say an exorbitant list of models, who needs 61 different ways to peel an apple? Um, the reality is we don't need to create new models, we can build on the ones in the literature find ones that work in the setting similar to where we are and capitalize on that. And the other piece I would argue here is that having a model is like many things we do. It's a, a cross check that in designing the study or building our materials, um, just as our stakeholders will be a hedge against gaps, so having a model helps us cross-check that we're uh, getting all the details and materials together uh, appropriately up front and ultimately uh, when we come to evaluation again, just as consort might be a reporting model for reporting out randomized trials, so these models become a way to structure our data collection and our analysis to evaluate our implementation and dissemination. So we want to go to a poll and ask you all, how often have you used a framework or theory to plan dissemination related activities? 
in your ongoing practice. And the votes are tumbling in. We're up to about 20% of you have voted. Fifty percent voted. I think I can predict that the winner is going to be never here, right? Um, so we can see the results there. Never comes out as the most frequent coming back up from the bottom, rarely, sometimes, usually, and a real minority always having a framework in place to um, structure and plan a dissemination implementation activity. So let's look at a, a bit more application here. We talk about design for dissemination. This is not necessarily you know, a new idea, uh, being out there in um, school-based interventions, in primary care interventions, um, but the reality, as you see here from a national survey, is that many, many researchers are not in the mindset of uh, thinking of dissemination when they're up front in the design phase. But we might really want to turn this around and ask the question, are you designing your study so it can be sustained after funding goes away? So a colleague back in Boston, Steve Gortmaker, doing a lot of school-based interventions, actually designed a nutrition physical activity program so it was integrated into the curriculum. So the uh, getting kids to focus on fruits and vegetables and physical activity. He worked with the science and math instructors to build examples of fruits and vegetables and counting these into the curriculum, knowing full well that when the funding for his intervention went away, the curriculum would still be in the school. And so he was able to really design for that sustainable activity beyond the life of the funded research project. We've got other examples, um, and in part, this, where, how do I get my next slide, um, depends on the level that we are focused on for our uh, dissemination or implementation project. The notion again being that if we're um, working at the system level, if we're change, making changes, reminder systems in an electronic medical record, as Alan Dietrich has shown so effectively, that clearly can be sustain long after the project to evaluate implementation is in place. So system level changes are easy to see that they can fit with a, a design for dissemination and sustained activity. Many other processes uh, fit this model and we should also remember that we can be designing our tools for our interventions such that the products that we've used in the research setting are available and are really ready for widespread use. So we're doing this in the design phase. We can also think of that in the summarizing evidence and uh, the broader dissemination of evidence if we're making those summaries readily available and ones that can be tweaked if we're taking a product from one state to another or one cancer prevention coalition to another. Have we designed the product and 
made it available for the easy adaptation to new settings. So I want to give you an example. The top of the slide here, I point to Alan Dietrich's randomized control trial, really the evidence base that we used to collaborate with Alan and bring colorectal screening to primary care practices in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. So really fitting the model of having an evidence-based intervention. Uh, Alan showed randomized trial published in the British Medical Journal that provider education on its own didn't really solve getting colorectal cancer screening to its full potential in primary care. He bundled in his randomized trial provider education and technical assistance to modify office systems, put those together and uh, achieve significant increase in the implementation of screening. So we worked with Alan to, uh, and his staff obviously to take some of the tools he'd used in his randomized trial, adapt them to be more readily available, worked with the American Cancer Society New England Division as it was at the time, and then provided this technical assistance to practices to help them literally implement and monitor uh, colorectal screening. So we see at the bottom, uh, I hate to say we're almost, uh, as Russ predicted, Allen's trial published in 1992 and we're in 2005. It's only 13 years, shorter than 19, Russ, but still taking that long to get us to the phase of actually taking Alan's randomized trial and delivering it to primary care uh, across New England. Those tools that we had uh, from Alan adapted for broader application ultimately put together for the American Cancer Society so that they could then have a, a toolkit here called Tools and Strategies that they then took nationwide building from the materials that we developed with Alan. So um, clearly having a funder at the table helped speed that uh, dissemination with tools from our randomized uh, trial that Alan did to our implementation to national, but it is the sequence that we would argue can be spared up to raise population health standards uh, more quickly. So how do we um, actually get more uh, practice-based research? I would argue all 250 plus of you on this call are part of the solution. The example from Alan Dietrich coming out of the practice-based ne network that he had up in New Hampshire, uh, really a phenomenal opportunity um, that this group has to help set the agenda but also build the evidence that can then be more broadly applied to raise population health. So how do we not only build the research into the networks, but actually uh, build the evidence base? That was one of the questions earlier, how much of the evidence do we need? And Russ answered that, and that given the REAM model that talks about adaptation of tools, so how much of the evidence has to apply explicitly and specifically to your maybe unique setting versus it applies elsewhere, how much can a practice network add to the evidence? Obviously, one of the opportunities is actually evaluating 
natural experiments and we can think sitting here in St. Louis we have a natural experiment called the Mississippi. We've got Illinois on one side where there's Medicaid expansion, we've got uh, Missoula on the other side where there is no Medicaid expansion. How do these um, natural experiments, if you will, give us opportunities to assess changes in outcomes um, across something like the uh, state border. And we can equally argue that we are sitting with federally qualified health centers and rural health centers, networks of centers, centralized data systems uh, from these centers that would again be uh, responsive to some of the natural experiments particularly of late with the um, changes in funding that give us the chance to evaluate and build the evidence base from the more underserved settings that are typically not included in the research enterprise. Another component here, uh, and again this comes back to the question that Russ answered on growing funding, but we also need greater capacity on the uh, faculty and practice side partnerships that will work together to build the evidence base of what works and what we can uh, disseminate. So on the faculty side we need greater support and reward for what might look like slower, harder work doing uh, the evaluation in the under-resourced federally qualified health center versus a practice-based network that is better resourced. Uh, so how do we get our medical schools and health departments uh, to reward the harder, slower work compared to some of the other options, definitely part of the equation, part of the solution, and I see a part that is moving more rapidly with the changing emphasis from the roadmap and NIH funding, uh, medical school leaderships, public health schools, seeing that there are resources in this area are more willing to engage and invest in uh, capacity building to support this uh, type of research. One of the questions came up that we didn't answer relating to, you know, how do I learn more, where do we um, build the capacity? And um, that is obviously part of what we are working with AHRQ today to be uh, thinking through uh, how do we broaden capacity, uh, train practitioners. We have also got the question being addressed in our group of how do we train community members to be more actively engaged as stakeholders bringing underserved populations to understand some of the principles of research. How does an IRB work? What is its real purpose? So that they can uh, understand and participate and join as stakeholders in the studies that colleagues here are leading to understand the process of improving access to care for underserved and obviously around this environment uh, engagement of students clearly is part of uh, our collective future. In terms of training opportunities that again may answer some of the questions, uh, we have a NCI funded uh, program mentored training in dissemination and implementation research. Uh, 
Ross reads that, I'm a member, it, and the second item on this slide, uh, an implementation research institute that focuses on mental health issues. Both of these have a model of a week-long program in St. Louis in the summer, followed by uh, much more uh, hands-on mentoring over the year and a second meeting at the end of the year, again with mentors and other trainees to work through the design of a project, maybe writing an R21 or grant to health department or CDC, AHRQ, but a real uh, partnership of trainees and faculty from across the country and from Canada who are working in DNI to uh, support either the first cancer prevention and control research really across the spectrum of cancer and mental health. The third is an NIH sponsored um, training again uh, at least a week-long program. This summer Kaiser is helping sponsor this. Um, it tends to be held in a different uh, major city each year and again draws faculty and trainees from across the country. So for those of you interested in more details when the slides go up, uh, uh, links will be active from these three and you can uh, link out and get more details on these programs. So I mentioned policy, the expansion of Medicaid as, if you will, a big P example of how do we study policy. Some of the challenge with policy around health care and access to services is that it feels pretty remote from our day-to-day -day life and that also makes it hard to plan research around the process since we don't really have much control over the timing of uh, when a national policy or even a state policy may go into play. But there's also the small p, the changes in our work site, the changes in a hospital system or a hospital network or a primary care network that we actually have a lot more of a handle on. Maybe even we have representation on the committee framing the change and the timing of the change. We may have a lot more opportunity in that smaller local setting to actually evaluate the um, impact of policy change on changes in practice, changes in outcomes, and again, ultimately improving the population health. But either of these big P or little p policy issues feels a lot messier than even asking, can we increase the proportion of our patients uh, getting colorectal screening, which itself is not the crispus intervention, but um, may seem a lot more under our control than uh, the policy piece. Yet policy does drive access and practice in bringing more evidence to what works will ultimately help us inform better policy and better practice outcomes. But however you look at it, it's messy. And we just have this quote here to remind us uh, how messy policy making can be. So we've mentioned a couple of um, examples. Uh, question of funding came up earlier. Rust has mentioned um, the National Cancer Institute, NIMH, mental health, AHRQ routinely has uh, funding announcements around 
implementation of evidence-based practices with a priority for elderly, underserved, urban poor, etc. So a growing number of funding opportunities that are resonating with this dissemination implementation focus on speeding the transfer of evidence to practice. So we can conclude that there are many, many opportunities. Sharpening the research focus will help improve the evidence base for what works in the practice networks, what works beyond the challenge that I see and was reminded of as Russ was talking, the details of the context that the original studies are conducted in often is poorly described in the research reports, which then limits our inference of will this work in my practice, in my setting. Uh, so there's a feedback loop here to improve that understanding of context as part of the uh, whole process of uh, evidence synthesis, identification of evidence-based practices, and then the dissemination and implementation research. We've noted that there are um, many theories, practices, overlapping theories and uh, frameworks, and not to perseverate, have I got the right framework, but really using a framework to help structure thinking and uh, identify the completeness and rigor of the approach that we're taking. And across the board, the notion as Ross began introducing that um, dissemination and implementation evidence typically looks messy, is messy, and the purpose of the research framework for me is in part trying to bring some order to the messiness so we really can identify what is working in the real world and then take that forward more broadly to improve population health. So let's not become another Bill Murray and go forward. Here are some resources and we're happy to take uh, more questions if you have them now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Colder. It's um, also a very interesting presentation. Um, we are putting up the slide for contact information um, and encourage everyone, again, to submit a question. As a reminder, uh, a copy of today's slides will be circulated to all of you who are able to join the presentation. And a recording of today's presentation will be made available on the um, our YouTube channel. Um, and we will be notifying participants once the recording is available. Um, so encourage everyone, again, to submit your questions. And we will um, answer them as, uh, as we can, as time allows. Uh, so one question um, has to do with stakeholder engagement. How yeah. much has uh, CBPR, community-based participatory research, factored into the stakeholder engagement approaches that you mentioned are so important in DNI research? And what other stakeholder engagement approaches have been used for engaging stakeholders? Thank you, and thanks to Peter for the question. The challenge for me is to think more broadly than the classic CBPR. I think, yes, uh, we do use that and we think that way. But one of our colleagues here is an anesthesiologist studying practices in anesthesia. And who are his stakeholders? Are they anesthesiologists not in academic medicine, 
of the healthcare administrators who are spending a billion dollars a year on equipment that maybe his studies are showing add zero value to outcomes from uh, anesthesia. Uh, whole set of stakeholders who are far removed from the community we're normally thinking of, but in fact essential if his research in the uh, processes of anesthesia are going to uh, be adopted by uh, hospitals, hospital administrators, community anesthesiologists. Um, so it does uh, vary, but getting outside our um, bubble, if you will, of just talking to people who are exactly like us with the same training and the same practice in the same setting uh, becomes key with the, if you like, the principles of CBPR applying across the board from engagement in design to interpretation of results to framing the reporting and messaging that comes from the study. Great, thank you. Uh, again, encourage everyone to submit questions, and both to Dr. Coltis and Dr. Brownson, so we can open it up to both of them again. Um, another question that came in for you, Dr. Coltis, is can you speak more about the balance between evidence-based fidelity versus adaptation to practice when planning research approaches? This is a great question. and. I can talk to how I think about it. I um, predict that if you ask 10 others doing DNA research, you might get 10 variations on the answer. Um, the finding an evidence-based intervention uh, is the first piece. And for me, we absolutely then have to be um, prepared for adaptation, whether it's tailoring to different race, ethnic uh, practices, expectations, or um, practice settings, uh, that is part of the reality as I see it of going forward with uh, DNI uh, research and practice. And to get too hung up on the um, any change to the uh, approach means that we're no longer using an evidence-based approach and we have to go back and do, if you will, another randomized trial to show that tweaking the intervention um, a little has suddenly changed it. Um, to me, that slows down this whole process um, inordinately and unnecessarily. But there is a balance here, and I think you would get perhaps different answers from different uh, investigators. I don't know whether, Russ, you have any um, principles to help guide that balance? Only two quick things I would add. I agree with what you said, Graham. It does somewhat depend on the eye of the beholder. I think one is some of the guidelines and reviews now have tried to identify, sometimes they call them core elements or active ingredients. So if that's available, those may be the things that you want to be careful about changing. And then I also think it depends on the maturity of a, of a topic. So for example, if we're working in tobacco control in the U.S., we know pretty well what those core elements are and, and what needs to be done to reduce tobacco use. Whereas if we're doing Ebola prevention or Ebola control globally in a whole bunch of different contexts, where, the, where there's not a lot of agreement on a lot of evidence-based approaches, we may, we may set the bar differently around fidelity and adaptation and also just sort of the immediacy of the problem. If, if you've got something like Ebola where, where people are, are real, you know, with a, such a high fatality rate, you may, you may keep the evidence bar fairly low just to try what you think might work to try to save lives when you don't have time to really do more systematic study. Thanks. Thank you. Um, one question that actually came through the 
chat function. So just a reminder for everybody to use the question function um, to submit your questions. Um, I think you've spoken to this already a bit, but maybe you wanted to expand one or both of you. Um, in terms of how can primary care practices get involved in DNI research? How, what are some of the elements that they could do from the task? Well, I think the um, AHRQ uh, sponsored practice based networks is one strategy. I clearly understand that there are networks of uh, federally qualified health centers and uh, many other groups uh, out there who may or may not be tied to medical centers or um, centers that have clinical translational science uh, awards, comprehensive cancer centers more and more are under pressure to be delivering prevention and control more broadly and with that comes the need to study how to do that most effectively. Um, so I would think one strategy is to uh, find colleagues either locally or regionally who are in networks. Uh, my sense more and more is that networks are expanding uh, given the push from PCORI and AHRQ to, to be delivering and evaluating in the real world, there's probably more demand for networks than there are practices tied in at this stage. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a reminder everybody to use the question function to submit any, uh, any questions. Um, you just mentioned um, Pukori. I don't know um, if you have more information about a uh, question that came in was what are some of the efforts that Pukori right. is doing in dissemination implementation sure. research? So Pukori um, has both some priority areas in dissemination. They have some uh, handbooks online that are uh, easily identified on the PCORI website and download. They give a framework for DNI research. They have a toolkit for DNI. Um, so I see it as a major effort from uh, their side to increase the emphasis on this sort of um, research in the real practice setting, not in the sort of ivory tower of academic medicine. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came in is, it seems that the tra traditional designs are also not directly generalizable to practice-based research. And so what are your thoughts, maybe both of you, on the methodological differences um, and, and on overcoming the common position of the infer of inferiority of anything other than uh, randomized controlled trials. This is a, a debate we are often in, as the question alludes, right? Um, and the pragmatic, practical clinical trials are one response with a far broader inclusion of uh, patients and participants in the trials, a related issue that we're studying with um, NCI funding is just how well we're documenting the mix of uh, comorbid conditions among the patients in prevention studies because after all that's part of the shift from the super refined efficacy study to the real world of America with a great and broad range of comorbidities. Um, and that also comes back to the value of observational data that um, clearly can at times include the, the broader network of 
the population, NHANES data, and so on. I think in part it depends on the question being asked and in part the um, audience as to how resistant they are to uh, anything other than randomized evidence. Again, the shift to more practical and pragmatic trials suggests to me that the funding agencies have uh, mo maybe moved ahead of the opinion leaders in medicine to, to see the value of bringing more practice-based evidence uh, to the table. And equally, PCORI's funding methods researchers to understand how best to glean unbiased estimates from um, observational data. Thank you very much. Um, encourage everyone to submit questions. I think we have time for one or two more. Um, are there any additional comments that you, Dr. Brownson, wanted to make in the interim? Only the one on the design question, I agree fully with Graham, it's really matching the, the design to the questions you're trying to answer and, the, and the, the sort of the circumstances of the study. But I would say if you're, if you're going to not use, you know, if you use an RCT, you don't usually have to defend it, but if you're not going to use a randomized design, and I've even run into this when I'm using a group randomized design, it just makes sure you give the rationale for it and make sure, in a, not in a defensive way, but at least in a very short explanation, give the the reason of choosing that design. And then what I'm seeing increasingly in the proposals I've been reviewing in different settings is the use of mixed methods and the idea of qualitative methods, um, either sitting separate from, but also linking qualitative methods with quantitative methods so that maybe some qualitative approach informs your design or helps you to develop measures better or informs the study. And I think for those of you on the line who are really doing research, that I think a lot of you do this already, but a lot of things you can really do that. Um, I did notice, Gabrielle, a question on here about if any of the training programs Graham mentioned are open to people who aren't doctorally trained. Yeah. <laughs> and that challenge, um, is it okay if I answer that one? Absolutely, yep. We haven't been able to get to all of them, but yes, go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question because that's come up many times. Um, the training programs we mentioned are all doctorally focused. Um, it depends where you are, really. So whoever, I can't see who answered that, but if you'll email uh, Graham and me, we can link you with maybe some resources in your region. Um, we teach a couple of courses here at Washington University that are open to master's students. And it may be, even if you've graduated with your master's degree, there may be courses around you um, that are available for master's trained people. Um, unfortunately, most of the, the trainings that I know of that are federally supportive on a large scale are mostly trained, are set up for people who have a doctorate. Um, I do think also we've, we've tried to categorize a number of these training programs. So if we know where you are and, and what's available, there may be things available at a distance through online learning or maybe even in your local area. It is a need that's not really being met right now. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and then a last question that came in um, is about the uh, you know best places to start to find out more about best practices in disseminating research findings. I think I'd encourage this person to look at the further reading slide that um, that you had, Dr. Colbert, um, and we'll again we will be sending out the slides to everyone. But uh, I don't know, Dr. Colbert or Dr. Bronson, if you have any other pointers you'd like to provide on um, on this other sources of uh, information. Thanks. I probably would add what was not on our list, reviews like the Cochrane synthesis um, above and beyond preventive services and CDC um, prevention summaries. The Cochrane reviews certainly keep an up-to-date uh, evidence base on many, many uh, medical and healthcare interventions just as CDC does for the um, public health practice interventions. 
And then the one other online, I don't know that it was in our listing, but <coughs> the National Cancer Institute, through their implementation science program, they keep a nice web portal. So if you just Google National Cancer Institute and implementation science, that's got a nice set of resources as well. And even if you're not necessarily interested in cancer, <coughs> they would affect more broadly to a number of different areas. And so, and they keep it pretty current. They have special webinars, and so it's worth worth subscribing there. Thank you very much again to both of you. Um, this was a very interesting presentation and um, obviously brought some uh, interest among, uh, a lot of interest among our participants. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Christina who will talk a little bit about obtaining CME credits and some other upcoming events that the PBRN Resource Center is hosting. Great. Thank you, Gabriella. So thank you so much for attending today's PBRN webinar. This live series activity has been approved for 1.25 elective CME credits by the American Academy of Family Physicians. So on the screen here, we have the steps for obtaining your CME certificate of participation. So please complete the online evaluation of this webinar, which you will be prompted to do upon exiting. And then please email us at pbrn at abt ASSOC.com if you would like to request a copy of your CME Certificate of Participation. Please join us for our upcoming PBRN webinars on August 18th and September 19th. To learn more about these events and to register, visit the link shown on the screen. And then we also invite you, if you aren't already on our PBRN listserv, where we have general announcements of interest to PBRNs please email us to subscribe at pbrn at abtassoc.com. Thank you again for attending today's PBRN webinar, and thank you to our presenters. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. It was great being with you. Thank you very much.